evening and welcome to Grace Baptist Church here tonight on this Wednesday night. Take your hymnal, turn to hymn number to 524, 524. Let's stand together as we sing, Saved by the Blood of the Crucified One. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son, saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood. Amen. Love those songs of testimony. And I hope uh, that's true for you tonight, that you can say that you're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Well, uh, our pastor is visiting a, a brand new granddaughter in California. And so uh, he's away, and uh, Miss Amy's away as well, and tonight, and I wanted to know where he was. So um, I will be teaching the next segment of Baptist Distinctives, and then, so my elective, uh, my usual group will stay in here tonight, uh, and we'll be back to normal next week. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of meeting tonight. Lord, we want, um, you have a very specific plan and purpose for us as we meet, and we pray that we would fulfill all of that, Lord, as we meet together. Uh, may your will be done, may Christ be glorified, and believers strengthened and encouraged, we ask uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Well, a few events uh, coming up here at the end of the week, the Never Alone Widow's Lunch tomorrow at 1130. Then tomorrow is uh, a men's luncheon Thursday. And so meet tomorrow at noon at Yummy Buffet. Uh, the college kids hang out tomorrow at 630 at the Gunther home. And then just a reminder that uh, this next Monday, I'm sorry, not next Monday, but Monday, February 27, uh, the Ladies of Grace Chicks Mix a bunch will meet, and that's for all ladies and teen girls. And uh, the reason it's in the prayer prompter tonight is because it would be helpful if you would sign up at the Information Center. Just let uh, us know that you're planning to be there. Uh, do you have guests with you, or whatever the case may be? And uh, so be sure to do that if you know that you're able to come, hope you can. Um, let me just mention too, um, Pastor will be away this Sunday. I'll be preaching in the morning and Pastor Ryan will be preaching in the evening. And then Sunday afternoon, uh, we've been invited as a church family to a concert given by Heather Scott and Stacy Scott Edwards, uh, Steve and Sue's daughter and daughter-in-law. Uh, they play the cello and the piano, and they'll be having a recital at 3 p.m. this Sunday afternoon at the First Presbyterian Church in Newcastle. That's 3 p.m. this Sunday afternoon, the First Presbyterian Church in Newcastle, and there's a, a little flyer uh, with that information at the Info Center if, if you need it. Those are all the announcements as we look at the prayer prompter. Note, note the people of the week, if you would. Um, 
Let me just mention Slim and Alice Walker. Uh, both are dealing with health issues and Slim is trying to be a caregiver um, as well as uh, having some of his own health needs and difficulties and so be in prayer especially for them. The Fries uh, have a, a, a sad note about a, a family that means a great deal to them uh, from Peru. Uh, it, it's, it turned out fine, uh, but there's a real need there. And so be sure to check that uh, update. And uh, the Fries will be here for our missions conference uh, coming up the first Sunday of March. We're, we'll be glad to have them here in person uh, for that. On the request side of the sheet, uh, be sure to pray for Larry Childs. He's at Ball. Um, he had a heart attack earlier this week, and uh, they're running tests. And so he's in CCU, and be sure to pray for Larry. Uh, Jody Graham uh, still would like us to pray for her family situation. And then uh, Hudson takes this test that he needs to pass in order to graduate. Uh, be sure to pray for him, and there's a praise there as well. Brenda Grinstead would like us to pray for her as she witnesses to Haley, um, and then for a health need, Kimberly Lawrence uh, remains in a comatose state after a car accident. Uh, she's thankful for the prayers, and uh, that's the backstory behind that note, in case some of you may not have been familiar with that situation. All right. Well, we're glad to take requests from the floor. We'll start with this section. And is there anyone with a praise or a prayer request um, for, to, to add to our list tonight? It's good to see Phyllis here, Tom. All right. How about this next section, Rhonda? The little baby that we prayed for that was a preemie, he's back in the hospital with a respiratory infection, got put in yesterday. So if you'll pray for him, his name is Damon. And then I'm assuming you've heard about Frank Garlock's news that's out there on Facebook. No, I haven't seen it. They've determined he has a mass, and so they've sent him on to, see what hospital? Mercy or some hospital further in Florida. So okay. that's a new thing that happened apparently today but it's out there on Facebook. You said that was Frank Garlock? Okay. Pray for little Damon and then for Frank Garlock, who's a legend in music ministry uh, in his 90s. He, I, last time I saw him, he said, I'll praise the Lord while I have breath. <laughs> he quoted that Psalm. And uh, so pray for him. All right. How about this section over here? Yes, down front. Mike is coming. So I just want to thank the Lord for getting me through today. Today was my mother's seventh year death anniversary. So I want to thank the Lord for getting me through that. It was easier than I thought. Um, but I, my roommate, she needs a lot of prayers. She went to the hospital today for pneumonia. Um, we thought it was bronchitis. Normally when she gets bronchitis, she's in the hospital. But unfortunately, it's pneumonia this time. And she's in her early 50s, so you know that can't be good for her. So I just need her prayers, please. All right, let's pray for this roommate with pneumonia. Angel. Wonder if you guys would mind turning on these monitors? Um, it's hard to hear that booming out there. I can't, I can't hear very well. That's my, that's my fault. Jared? Uh, um, so I want to, I got a prayer request. Um, when I worked down in the, uh, at the Indianapolis branch for about seven and a half months, I worked with this girl, her name's Sabrina Cowan. And uh, she had worked with WC for, I don't know, over five years probably. 
But uh, two months ago, she, uh, she just didn't come back to work. And she's a really hard worker, you know. She's there all the time and doesn't miss. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Somebody told me that they felt she was getting into some, some illegal activities, you know. So maybe drugs. But uh, anyways, what, two months ago, she quit her job and uh, two days ago she got shot and killed in her front yard down mm -hmm. in Indianapolis so she's just 30 years old she's got a 12 year old daughter so uh, if we could keep her family in prayer um, it's the family of Sabrina Cowan and um, then also I have a, a praise so you know the Gideons have been going back to the jail Yes. here since February 6th and uh, they they give us 30 minutes each for that's that's how they planned it was 30 minutes each for the classes and you have I think usually two classes in a row so the first report that we got from the Gideons is that they had 20 minutes you know so to prepare for 20 minutes and then uh, the next set of men said that they had 25 minutes and then me and uh, a brother named Kenny Maxwell, we went Sunday, and uh, we got 35 minutes the first time. And then the second class, we had an hour and 40 minutes. Wow. Um, I actually started to think they were not going to come back and get us. But, uh, but regardless, man, what a praise, you know. Yeah. Um, we got to spend that time, and we gave, we were prepared for 20 minutes, so... Um, yeah, the rest of the time we just uh, interacted with them, you know, talked with yeah. them. And then I thought, well, if we're going to sit here, let's just start reading, you know. So yeah. <laughs> we just started reading. And uh, all the inmates, uh, except for one, you know, took part in that. And it was just a great time. Um, now, there was five men in that class, and three of them claimed to be Muslim, you know. But mm -hmm. they were very respectful. And um, so... If you could keep us in prayer also, so it looks like on my Sundays that I will go there. So I go there again, uh, you know, another week and a half, and it's the same group of men. So it looks like we'll be, me and Kenny will be with those same group of men. So just pray for wisdom and, and guidance as we minister to these men. And um, yeah, just praise God for that, you know, extra time. I felt like yeah. that was a, divine employment you yeah. know but uh that's great they, they always say it's easier to get in jail and get out you know and <laughs> i was uh afraid like i said that the the officers just left like they yeah. left and um i don't know when a guy finally came back and got us he said oh man we had shift change and then <laughs> you know they they locked them down to count heads and anyways it was it was an awesome time so good. i appreciate that good Pray for the Gideon's jail ministry and pray that the door opens for RU to resume their jail ministry there. Right now, that's a closed door uh, on the jail side of things. So pray, pray for these opportunities. Uh, someone else in this section? Yeah, Brother Don. Warren's injured his knee again so this afternoon, so he's uh, requesting prayer. Okay, pray for Warren Anderson. Someone else? How about this next section? Anyone? All right, last chance for anyone from the floor. All right, Greg Dillard's group is already down at the choir room. Uh, Wanda Mitchell's is already there, and again, uh, I'm going to be staying in here tonight, so my elective group will not be meeting. We'll pick up where we left off next Wednesday night. Mike has, uh, the ushers have some uh, handouts for tonight. Pastor was going to be uh, speaking on communion tonight, and so I'm, I'm just going to pick up uh, this is my material. It's difficult to teach and preach somebody else's material. But um, he's going to pick up 
where we leave off uh, next week. Wh wherever he left off, he's going to pick up next week. And uh, we'll probably touch on communion, but not to the extent that we do tonight. We are looking at the ordinance of communion tonight. I read a story this week how that three times a month, uh, Jermaine Washington and Michelle Stevens get together for what they call a gratitude lunch. And the article said, with good reason, Washington donated a kidney to Stevens, whom he, decried, whom he de described as just a friend. They met at work where they had lunch together, and uh, one day Michelle wept as she spoke about waiting on a kidney donor list for 11 months, and she was being sustained by dialysis, but suffered chronic fatigue and blackouts and was plagued by joint pain. And because Washington couldn't stand the thought of watching his friend die, he gave her one of his kidneys. And so they get together uh, three times a month uh, to remember. And that's really, uh, in a, a simple way, uh, of looking at the profound thing that we do with communion. We get together and we remember. Um, there's a quote there about Baptist distinctives. There is no single distinctive doctrine which makes men Baptists. It is their position on a number of beliefs which, when taken together, make them a distinctive people. And so we're looking at what makes us Baptist, why the sign says Baptist. And uh, one of the distinctives is that there are two local church ordinances. Uh, Believer's baptism that Pastor, I think, looked at just in the last couple weeks, and, and then communion. And these ordinances have been given to us by the Lord uh, to be observed within the context of the New Testament local church. Uh, sometimes you hear about uh, people baptizing or having communion um, on a Holy Land tour or a family reunion, or I even have heard about uh, youth retreats where they used uh, potato chips and Pepsi uh, for the elements um, for communion. And, uh, but we believe that the New Testament is wrapped up in the local church and everything uh, connected with it, uh, including the ordinances, are celebrated, observed in that context. Well, let's look first of all at the names for communion, the names for communion. Of course, there's communion. It's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And so God intends for us to commune with him. That's the word in the blank. God intends for us to commune with him and with each other at this special ceremony. Then there's the Lord's table, Lord's table. And we find reference to that in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. He's talking to believers who were trying to uh, straddle um, the, have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And, uh, but he refers to it as the Lord's table there, Paul does. And, of, of course, uh, they initially celebrated uh, the first Lord's Supper was celebrated at a, a table. And then thirdly, the Lord's Supper, as I just said, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's, he's talking about another issue there, but he's referring to communion as the Lord's Supper. And that's because the Lord instituted it at the Passover Supper. And that brings us to the setting for the first communion, the setting 
for the first communion. And of course, it's the Passover. Christ was born and lived under the law. And although the four gospel accounts of his earthly life are found in what we call the New Testament or the New Agreement, his ministry on earth occurred during the dispensation that began with the Mosaic Law given on Mount Sinai. And this is the Old Testament or the Old Agreement. And that dispensation did not end until after Christ's death and resurrection. So Jesus observed the yearly Passover as required in the law. Um, he did so, uh, certainly we, we don't read of this, but we, we know because he was raised in a home uh, that practiced uh, Judaism and was true to the law. And uh, he, he participated in the Passover certainly every year of his life, but we read uh, in the New Testament, we read only of the last Passover, the night before he hung on the cross. But of course, the Passover commemorated the time that the death angel passed over every family in Egypt that had applied the blood of a lamb to the doorposts of its house. And turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And I'd like to begin reading at verse 1. And as, as we look at the book of Exodus here, if you would, just look at it through the lens of communion. And knowing what we know now, um, looking at it in light of the Lord's Supper. If Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls, however, how many people live there. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, notice, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. That was three days later, I believe, because he mentions the 11th day, uh, the 10th day just a moment ago. Keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So this is something they were all going to do in each home at the same time. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. Leaven in the Bible is a picture of sin. And, uh, of course, the sacrifice had to be uh, without leaven uh, so that it, as it pictured the sacrifice to come of the Lord Jesus, his sinless sacrifice. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it, eat not of it raw or nor sodden at all, or, meaning boiled with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence or the entrails thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast 
by an ordinance forever. And so, and so Jesus did that, uh, as every good Jew did. He kept the Passover every year. So Hebrews 10 tells us that the law uh, is a shadow of good things to come, but not the image, of, not the very image of the things. And so this is a picture pointing ahead to an event uh, that looking back, we know, uh, became communion or became the crucifixion um, of the Lord Jesus Christ and would be the time while Jesus observed his final Passover the night before he was crucified would be the context for him instituting communion. Turn to Luke chapter 22, if you would. Luke 22. In verse 14. And here we find Jesus instituting communion, Luke 22, verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Uh, it was really on his heart. He really looked forward to it. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Verse 20, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And so at the last Passover of Jesus' life, Christ showed his disciples that there would be no more Passover feasts after this one. No more killing of lambs. And here Jesus instituted communion in the Passover setting. And so this places his statements regarding the bread and the cup in the context of a substitutionary death. Substitutionary is the word in the blank. This substitutionary death would bring deliverance and just as a spotless lamb was slain as the substance as the substitute for the firstborn son of a Hebrew family in Egypt, so the Lamb of God dies as the sinner's substitute. Of course, John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 29, saw Jesus coming unto him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So we don't have to wonder uh, about the connection here. Uh, it's the Lamb that was pointing of, of the Old Testament Passover was pointing to the lamb of the New Testament cross. And so in the same way that God's people Israel remembered the Passover lamb at the Passover meal, God's people, the church, remember Calvary's lamb at communion. Both memorials were established by God. Both memorials. Both were established the night before the events that they would later memorialize. Both were established the night before the events that they would later memorialize. And both center, both Passover and communion center on a lamb that was sacrificed. Again, it's very clear from scripture, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Of course, that lamb, as we read, could have no spots or blemishes or it was unfit to be used as a sacrifice. When Christ died on the cross, he did so without spot or blemish. He was the perfect lamb for our sacrifice. He was the lamb of God, our Passover, sacrificed for us. And so we read in 1 Peter, but with the precious blood of Christ, we were redeemed 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Christ, our Passover, died upon the cross. Passover was only for God's covenant people, the nation of Israel, and anyone that uh, might be from a, a Gentile background that wanted to align themselves with God's people and uh, begin to observe the law, live with God's people under the covenant that God had established with Israel. Um, Passover was only for them. It was limited only to those who were in covenant with God. And it, of course, was meaningless uh, for anyone who was not truly redeemed. And so in the same way, communion is meant to be observed only by those who have entered into the new covenant in his blood, the new covenant in his blood. Of course, the only way to approach God is on his terms, and we must receive the forgiveness he offers to us through Christ. And I have no way of knowing who's watching on live stream, and there might be someone here that has never truly been born again. And I would challenge you to accept Jesus, the Lamb of God, as your personal Savior from sin. So that was the setting for the first communion. Then we come to the elements of communion. And of course, first of all, there's the bread. And let me invite you to turn to the, probably the central passage of communion is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, and notice verse 23. Paul says, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now here we're talking about symbolic language, symbolic language, it's figurative. Just like when Jesus said, I am the door, or I am the vine. He wasn't speaking literally. Of course, uh, this bread was unleavened, which is a fitting symbol of the pure, sinless body of Christ. He said, I am the bread of life in John 6, verse 35. And his body was broken at Calvary for the benefit of mankind, the once for all sacrifice for sin. And note, if you would, that his bones were not broken when he died. We, there's a prophecy that not a one of his bones would be broken, and that came to pass that not one of his bones was broken. But his body was broken. His body was broken. So there's the bread. And then there's the cup. And we come to that in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, the new agreement, the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And again, this is symbolically he's speaking. Of course, the cup did not contain his actual blood. Uh, of course, that was still in his veins. Uh, the... I would mention also that the drink in the cup also would be without leaven or yeast, uh, or it would not be a fitting symbol of the purity of the blood of Christ. But this blood would be shed to secure the new covenant. In the Mosaic covenant under Moses, the, the, it was animal blood that was used. Under the new covenant, Christ's blood, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament sacrifices was in Christ. And of course, his blood is what provides us full forgiveness and a genuine spiritual relationship with God and provides for us the indwelling of his spirit. Now, there are a couple of views uh, re related to the elements um, that are pretty common. 
and yet not, in our view, biblical. Um, the first view is called transubstantiation, and that's not something you have to memorize or keep track of, just simply to say that this is the Roman Catholic view. This is the Roman Catholic view. The root there, trans, means to go across to. Substantiation means substance. You put the two together, and the view states that the bread and the fruit of the vine actually become the body and blood of the Lord Jesus when blessed by a priest. They are literally changed physically into his body and his blood. And of course, in this view, there is a repetition of the sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the world. Um, every time there is a mass, there is a new sacrifice, if, if it's literally the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And of course, uh, Scripture says otherwise. Hebrews 9, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Hebrews 10 by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 1 Peter 3, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So there's the view that the blood, the, the uh, bread and the cup become physically the actual body and blood of the Lord Jesus and then there's the view called by theologians consubstantiation. And this is primarily held by Lutherans. This is the Lutheran view. Con meaning with and substantiation again being substance. And this is, uh, the view here says that something spiritual happens to the elements they undergo a spiritual transformation mystically. Christ's body and blood are mystically present and combined with the bread and the juice, though the elements remain unchanged. And there's really no scriptural basis for either view. The elements undergo no physical or even spiritual process. They are simply symbols and while communion is uh, most certainly a spiritual endeavor and, and a celebration, um, there is no sense in which the elements undergo some type of spiritual transformation. So there are the elements, the bread and the cup, and then thirdly, the partaking, the partaking, letter C. The partaking. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, he says, eat this bread and drink this cup. In Matthew, he told the disciples, drink ye all, uh, meaning all of you, of it. And what eating and drinking symbolize um, is our previous personal acceptance of Christ by faith. We receive food into our bodies by our mouths and we receive Christ into our lives by faith. And the eating and drinking of the communion table picture that receiving of Christ as our Savior uh, in which we partook, partook of his body and his blood and the salvation provided by it. In John 6, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And that's what we do when we come to Christ. We eat of this bread. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So there's the partaking. And then number one under letter C, this do, he says. And this is a command to observe command to observe. So like baptism, communion is voluntary, but it's not optional. Communion is voluntary, but it's not optional. 
Then secondly, he says, in remembrance of me. This is how we do what we do. And why? The Greek word anamnesis means more than just recalling the events of Christ's crucifixion, but to respect, retrospectively treasure the work of Jesus Christ, his personal sacrifice, his character, to treasure the work of Jesus Christ. So it's looking back with a, a fondness, a love for, an appreciation for um, an event which, as dark as it was, is the most significant event in our spiritual history. If you put the work of Christ all together, the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. We who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb are commanded to remember when we partake of the Lord's Supper. We're to remember the substitutionary death of the Lord and all the blessings it provides. And then number three, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup. So how often? Well, the Bible uses that word often. But it doesn't say how often. Spurgeon thought that you should observe communion every Sunday. And I don't know of a church that does that except the Roman Catholic Mass. Um, I don't know of an evangelical church that observes it that frequently, but there may be some, there may be some. Church of Christ, although I think the Church of Christ connects it to salvation in a um, in a sacramental sense, but uh, they certainly do every service uh, observe communion. So Spurgeon thought you should uh, have communion every Sunday. Most evangelicals do it once a month, and that happens to be how we do it here. Some every other month or uh, once a quarter. And, um, but it's supposed to be often, even though the time frame is not prescribed by Scripture. And so there are the elements of communion. Then the message of communion is found in the last part of verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. I love those last six words. This is the sermon of communion. These last six words there, the Lord's death till he come, don't make any sense, humanly speaking. Did he die or not? And if he died, how can he come? And, um, of course, when we observe communion, we are proclaiming his death as we look back, and we are proclaiming at the very same time his literal return uh, as living Lord and Savior as we look ahead. And so there's this reminder implicit in communion that this was not the end of the story, that uh, Jesus is alive. And then finally, notice the conditions for communion. The first condition is personal salvation. Personal salvation. As we've seen, it, it's believers that have partaken of the bread of life. And an unsaved person has not partaken of Christ's sacrifice for him. And so Communion doesn't save, and again, I think that is the position of the Church of Christ uh, or the Christian Church, that communion saves, but it is observed by the saved. We observe communion not in order to become saved, but because we are saved. There's personal salvation that's a condition. Then there's personal identification. Personal identification, and this is baptism. In the New Testament, 
uh, only baptized believers, though who, those who had taken that first act of Christian obedience, participated in this ordinance of the church. There's no such thing in the New Testament as an unbaptized believer. Um, when they got saved, they got baptized. And um, they identified with the church and God's people. And so that's a condition for baptism, obedience in that basic first step for a believer uh, to, to identify with the Lord in believer's baptism. It's, it's so important, and uh, it's why people are baptized around the world every day in peril of their lives. Then personal examination is another condition, the final condition for communion. Personal examination. We must not partake in an unworthy way, uh, which is to partake with an unexamined life. Um, no one is worthy of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one is worthy of salvation. And so if a person doesn't participate in communion because they are not worthy of the blood and body of Christ. None of us could participate in communion. None of us is deserving or worthy of the sacrifice of Christ. But this has to do with the way in which we observe. We're not to participate in an unworthy manner for the Corinthians, uh, Paul had to point to their gluttony and drunkenness at, at the meal that accompanied communion. Um, and we read, again, this passage every time we observe the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, Whereso, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily or in an unfitting way, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself. That's the key, is personal examination. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That word damnation means destruction. And Paul says, this is important because for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep, many have died. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And so we come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know my heart, and I need you to show me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. I, I need you to show me uh, ways in which I may not be right with you this morning. Um, are there ways... Um, in which I'm not right with other people? Is there a brother or sister in Christ that I need to make things right with? And we must be right with God and with others. There's a well-known painting of the National Vietnam Memorial, or the wall, that depicts a young widow and her daughter standing at the wall, and they're reaching up and touching the name of the husband and the father who died and the reflection in the polished granite is not of the mother and daughter, but is of the husband and father reaching out his hand on the other side of the wall to touch theirs. And that is a pretty decent picture of the Lord's Supper. We come to the table and we reach out our hands to take this unleavened bread and this fruit of the vine in, re in response to our act of faith, the Savior meets with us. He's on the other side of the table, on the other side of the cross, and he fellowships with us there. Just three uh, action points for you to consider before we go. First of all, what kind of attitude should you have during communion? And what would you need to do to have that attitude? Is there something, um, this is just an encouragement to look at the way you come to communion. Um, 
even at once a month, it's frequent enough that it's easy just to do it and do it and get it done. And how important it is that we uh, give our hearts and minds to it um, every time we have that opportunity. And then uh, think about your personal sermon, your personal sermon during communion service. What do you, what do you usually do during communion? I've seen some Christians do some pretty um, distracting things during communion. Um, things that at least appear to say that they're not centered on what we're doing. What's your personal sermon? What do you usually do during communion? What do you proclaim to those around you? What, what do they see? I'm not saying you should have your Bible open. Um, I know um, someone encouraged me to be in my Bible during communion uh, years ago. Uh, sometimes I know uh, looking at hymns uh, of the cross or the blood um, help focus a, a believer's heart on the work of Christ. Uh, but certainly prayer and um, but what do you, what does your observance of communion proclaim to those around you? How important it is, it, is it to you? And does it look that way? And then thirdly, make it a habit to examine yourself before God and to remember your Lord every day, not just during communion services. Keep your communion with God uninterrupted, uninterrupted. I remember some time ago being convicted by what I th saw as the number of days that I just failed completely to thank the Lord for his cross. And how awful that uh, can be in a Christian's life, that there would be a day go by that we just don't stop and say, thank you for the cross. And um, so we don't need to wait until communion to remember the Lord. And we don't want to, the, of course, communion was given to us so that we would remember. But how much better it is even still uh, to remember him daily and to thank him daily for his sacrifice for us. All right. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the blood of the sacrifice, the Lord Jesus, uh, who, because uh, of his blood, provides for us life and salvation, redemption from sin and sorrow and death. Lord, I pray that as the hymn says, uh, near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me live from day to day with its shadows o'er me. Lord, may your cross be our breath and life. And uh, yet, Lord, as we have the opportunity uh, monthly here to observe your table, we pray that um, those times would be um, special and meaningful in our lives and that we would give them the heart and the attitude uh, that you mean for us to give them. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.